Today, we're going to take apart one of the most famous ideas in all of modern mathematics, George Cantor's work on infinity. Is it this absolute bedrock of logic that we all think it is? Or is it built on ground that's a little shakier than we've been led to believe? We're going to explore all of this through the eyes of a physicist who decided to get skeptical about the very numbers we use every single day. You know, our story here doesn't actually start with math. It starts with this really powerful memory. The author of the text we're looking at remembers a fellow physics student who, when he was handed a piece of lab equipment, didn't just use it. Nope. The first thing he did was dismantle it piece by piece to understand how it really worked. And that single act, that radical skepticism, well, it became the inspiration for everything that followed. All right, so to really get what's happening here, we first have to get inside the mind of the person asking these tough questions. This is basically the origin story of our skeptic. And this background is super important. I mean, this isn't just some random person. They're a trained physicist from Delft University. And that experience, seeing a student who refused to just trust a tool, who had to literally take it apart, that stuck with them. So years later, they decided to do the exact same thing to the abstract tools they used every day, the core concepts of mathematics. So what exactly is this mathematical apparatus that our physicist decided to dismantle? Well, it's none other than the groundbreaking, super influential work of 19th century mathematician George Cantor on the very nature of infinity itself. Okay, so Cantor's whole thing is about two different kinds of infinite sets of numbers. On one hand, you've got the natural numbers. Super simple, right? These are the counting numbers we learn as kids. One, two, three, and so on, forever. But on the other hand, you have the real numbers. Now this is the whole shebang. It's everything on the number line. Whole numbers, fractions, and all those weird irrational numbers like pi or the square root of two. You know, the ones whose decimals go on forever and ever without repeating. And this leads to the massive question that Cantor tackled. Okay, we've got these two infinite sets, but are they the same size of infinity? Using this incredibly clever proof called the diagonal argument, Cantor came to a shocking conclusion. No. He argued there are fundamentally, provably, more real numbers than natural numbers. And this idea of different sizes of infinity just became a cornerstone of modern math. But here's the twist. Our author says, hold on, Cantor skipped a step, a really, really big one. And right here, this is where the dismantling begins. According to our source text, the big problem with Cantor's grand theory isn't in the complicated stuff, it's in the most basic tool he's using, the very definition of a number. So here's the author's big claim. We all just assume we know what a number is. We use them every day, right? But the argument here is that when you actually try to nail down the definition, it's, well, it's surprisingly shaky. It gets called an abstract object. But what does that even mean when you're trying to be scientifically rigorous? In fact, the author puts it bluntly. They say there just is no proper definition of what a number really is. And think about that. If you can't even properly define your most basic building block, how in the world can you build a logically sound theory about infinity on top of it? Okay, so to really drive this point home, the author walks us through this amazing thought experiment. Let's dig into this idea of when a number just stops being a number. I want you to imagine a number. And no, not an infinite number, just a really, really big one. I'm talking about a number so ridiculously huge that just to write down all its digits, you'd need more material than there are atoms in the entire Milky Way galaxy. It's a mind-bending idea, but it is technically a finite number. So the real question is, does it still act like a number we can actually use? And this is where the author says, nope, this thing, it fails every single test of what we think a number should do. You can't really identify it or tell it apart from a similar one. You can't compare it. You definitely can't do any math with it. What does it even mean to add one to it? The idea becomes meaningless. The author's point is that way, way before we even touch the idea of infinity, the concept of a number has already broken down into a useless symbol. So, okay, if the very idea of a number falls apart when you push it to the extreme, then what does that say about Cantor's theory, which is all about infinite numbers? Well, this leads us to the author's final and pretty shocking verdict. The author doesn't see Cantor's work as some kind of bulletproof logical truth about the universe. Instead, they call it a fairy tale. Now, maybe it's a useful fairy tale, something that's great for getting close enough answers in physics or engineering, but an exact description of reality? No way. Because it's all built on these fuzzy, undefined ideas like number and infinity. It just can't be a rigorous, absolute truth. 
And that's where we're left. You see, this whole critique isn't just about one guy's math theory. It kind of pulls at the threads of how we think we know anything. It suggests that even in a field as pure and logical as math, we might be building these incredible structures on foundations that are way shakier than we thought. So the question I want to leave you with is a big one. If the very tools we use to describe reality are flawed, what can any of us ever really know for sure?